All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's Palm Sunday, and I, I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about this week and everything that this week represents with Jesus coming into Jerusalem during that Holy Week, or as many refer to as the Passion Week. And so I want to touch on that a little bit today in a message titled, Sir, We Wish to See Jesus. And that is the longing and the cry of humanity, and I think you'll see that as I unpack this more. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. If you weren't here, the last three weeks I gave a message series on communion with the Holy Spirit, and I would just really encourage you maybe go back and uh, watch that. I think you'll really be blessed by that. So if you got your Bibles, let's go to John chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading John's account of Jesus coming into uh, Jerusalem that week, and I'll be picking up in verse 12 and reading down through verse 33. Now, a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. Oh, I'm sorry, that was verse 9. Got ahead of myself here. Okay, verse 12. Now, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, out of Zechariah, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him and that they had done these things to him. Therefore, the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and had raised him from the dead bore witness. Now, in the preceding chapters where we read about Lazarus being raised from the dead. And so everyone has heard about this as this great stir in the city because of the dead raising of Lazarus. In verse 19, or verse 18, For this reason the people also met him because they heard that he had done this sign. Then verse 19, The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, You see that you are accomplishing nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And and they're obviously upset about the commotion uh, towards Jesus, and they're trying to quiet the whole thing down, and and you know try to. Now, there's been a dead raising in their midst, and here you have these religious leaders trying to pretend like nothing has happened. Then verse 20, it says, "Now there were certain Greeks among those who had come up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from the state of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus.'" Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life if anyone serves me let him follow me and where i am there my servant will be also if anyone serves me him my father will honor verse 27 now my soul jesus said is troubled and what shall i say father save me from this hour but for this purpose i came to this hour he's embracing what's ahead the cross and what's going to happen verse 28 father Glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. So here we have it. Jesus, again, this is John's account of Jesus coming in Jerusalem that week. He's come in riding on a colt, colt to the shouts of Hosanna. The people are gathering for Passover. There is this attitude of expectancy with what is happening. Again, let's look at John 12, 13 again. I'll look at it in the NIV. It says they took palm branches 
and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the king of Israel. They recognize he's the king of Israel. They believe he's the Messiah. Now that English word Hosanna is a transliteration of a Hebrew expression, Hosanna, which really is a a form of adoration, obviously, and I think most of us think of it in that way, but really it's a cry for help. It means to save. It's, it means to save, I pray, now. It, it's, like a, it's like a word or a phrase of desperation. Save, I pray, now. And what was interesting, and in, uh, the Jews still do this, it, during Passover week, and we're in Passover right now, uh, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118, that's known as the Halal, which means praise, the halal collection or praise collection that's read during Passover week. So the people are rejoicing. They're shouting, they're singing, they're actually recounting probably some of these verses from Psalm 113, 118. And why? Because they recognize Jesus as the King of Israel, as the Messiah. And in particular, Psalm 118, verse 25 says, Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. And again, you'll see a similar passage in Mark 11, verses 9 through 12. And you can read more of this again in Psalm 118. But in this phrase, uh, save now, I pray, O Lord, it's actually, again, this imperative aspect of Hosianna. And it literally means Anna Yahweh. Hosiana. In other words, God save us, we pray. God save us like never before. God send the Messiah, is what that psalm prophesied of the coming of the Messiah. And so they are literally shouting it out. They recognize Jesus is what is the one, the one that was prophesied back hundreds of years before. And also they're they're connecting in this moment as he's riding into Jerusalem. And so This second part of this verse, send now prosperity or success, it's from a Hebrew phrase, salak, and it could be said then of this last part of this verse, ana Yahweh salak now, which literally means now God break forth, advance Yahweh, bring it through to completion and success. There's an urgency with the people in this moment of adoration absolutely but they're asking jesus save us save us now save us now and bring it to completion let it be done and so it's very interesting because in other gospels we see what what's happening as well matthew 21 10 for example it says all the city was moved literally the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them you read that in matthew 21 14 they're literally asking some uh, again you have the true worshipers asking is this is this the messiah who who is this others know it is others are indifferent they're not sure and but it's the miracles that are drawing them it's the miracles that are drawing them in and so the miracles drew them and it caused even these skeptics to begin to wonder maybe maybe this is the promised messiah and it's really interesting because Jesus allows this large crowd in Jerusalem to gather. And most of the time through the Gospels, you would see he would sort of try to wean the crowd or keep the crowd small. But this time he allows the crowd to grow. Now why is that? You see, Jesus in this moment of coming in Jerusalem with these shouts of Hosanna, he's not just fulfilling prophecy, but certainly he was. But he's prophesying what was coming. What was coming? Well, we read in Mark's Gospel of this whole scenario at this time frame. Mark 11.17, Jesus quoting from Isaiah 56.7 says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. And literally, let's look here at Isaiah 56.7. Now, Isaiah 56 Verse 6 says that he's going to bring the foreigners or the Gentiles. He's going to bring them and gather them in, into his house. And, and now he's saying here in verse 7 of Isaiah 56, I will bring them to my holy mountain of Jerusalem and will fill them with joy in my house of prayer. I will accept their burnt offerings and sacrifices because my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations. In other words, 
Jesus will be the final, if you will, burnt sacrifice or, or offering. He will be the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, the Lamb of God that would carry our sin, our sorrow, our sickness, our disease. He would be that sacrifice. And because of that, all could gather in God's house, which is a house of prayer. It's a house of inclusiveness and of acceptance for all people of all nations, all tongues, all tribes, everyone throughout the age of humanity. And so this is God's desire. And his, his desire then is this greater if you will he has this greater vision of a house of prayer where all the nations are are welcome and and this is what he's after again he's allowed this large crowd and he's not only fulfilling prophecy but he's prophesying what was coming and this in his most public hour of his life in his ministry this is what's on jesus house uh, on on his heart he goes my house is going to be a house of prayer for all nations and so he's coming lowly on a donkey Riding into Jerusalem, again, not just to fulfill prophecy, but prophesying what he would do later, even in our day, right now, through his church, as he enters cities in humility, as the church walks in humility, and as the hands and feet of Jesus going out into the the lost, the least, and and the marginalized of society, and going out and ministering, and is expanding his kingdom and making his house one of prayer and communion where all people are welcome and and this is this is what's on the heart of god and it's still on his heart now at the time in jerusalem there's a whole different crowd yelling to to crucify him but not the true worshipers day after day they're they're wanting to get into the temple but the chief priest they had to take him by night because of the crowds but the worshipers again they're hanging on every word you know shouting hosanna save us god save us but the enemies are like shut it down jesus but jesus tells them listen if they are quiet even the rocks will cry out why this temple that's not made with human hands must be established nothing nothing you can do can stop this and this is true for the church through 2000 years of church history nothing the enemy can bring against the church the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of jesus christ his ha- his church is expanding his kingdom is expanding his house will be a house of prayer for all nations where people from all over can gather and be be uh, involved and listen evil no matter what the enemy brings whether it's 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 disease or pandemic or or evil governments or dictators we've seen throughout the course of human history nothing can stop the advancement of the church and there may be those even in our our hour that are trying to stop or silence or marginalize the church or trying to tell the church well what are you doing nothing's really happening but no no the church is the living expression of Jesus. The church, if you will, if we'll walk in humility or we're coming into our cities just like Jesus is, uh, did on that donkey, Jesus is still coming into cities to make a difference, to advance His kingdom, to draw in the lost and to expand His church. Now, what was happening, the people were filled with expectant hope. You see, hope fuels expectancy. But the people's hope was a bit misdirected. They're expecting a political Messiah. One who would restore the Davidic kingdom to Israel. They were expecting an earthly kingdom. But Jesus is pointing to one not made with human hands. Where all people are welcome. And it's still true today. Well, we have a heart for our nation. We should be praying for our nation or whatever nation you live in. If you're watching online from another place. Certainly, we want to pray, want to stop, pray against evil, and pray for righteous leaders, and pray for good government, all those kind of things. Pray against things that would be against biblical values, absolutely. But Jesus is pointing to something that goes beyond national borders or uh, policies that are made in governments. He's talking about a kingdom that transcends everything, and it's powerful, and it's expanding. And it's filled with hope. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, he said, and now faith, hope, and love abide. And these remain. Hope is from the Greek elpis, and it means to anticipate with pleasure. It's a confident expectation of a future event. 
You see, hope undergirds faith. And by very nature, by the very nature, hope is joyfully expectant. It's expecting something good to happen. And I don't know about you, but we're living in a moment right now. We've been through a tough year. Yeah, no doubt the pandemic, the economic consequences, the political divisions, all these things that we've seen happen over this last year and even into 2021, it's created a lot of tension. But at the same time, there's great hope. There's, there's a building of hope that I see in the body of Christ in particular, an expectation that something is about to happen, that Jesus is about to break through, that revival and awakening is about to unfold like we've never known before. Many in the church are beginning to prophesy or get glimpses of it. We see it. We sense it. We, we can taste it. Out of the midst of the, the heartache and the sadness and even grief that some are still going through because of what the pandemic and all the subsequent uh, results have caused, there's still great hope and expectancy. And here's the thing. God is inviting the church now, as He has through every age, to walk filled with hope. You see, hope diffused to the church, it lifts society. It brings an awareness of God's kingdom and that all things are possible with God. That's what our, some of our calling is, some of our mandate is. I remember years ago, we were coming out of a restaurant, my wife and I and daughter, and, and uh, ran into a man who God just kind of put on our heart to begin to minister him. He was right outside of the, the restaurant, and um, he, was, he was there, and, and uh, he was really down on his luck. He just, we found out as we began to talk to him and, and uh, encourage him and eventually pray for him, that he was laid off as a barista. And, uh, you know, and so, uh, you know, he had this job and all of a sudden, it, you know, the job's gone. And, and all of a sudden, I said, well, can we pray for you? Because God wants to, you know, to turn this situation around. And, and, you know, God is always a God of hope. He's always a God of optimism. And he closes one door. He always opens another. The man said, sure, yep, yeah, go ahead and pray. So we began to pray for the man. And as soon as we did, very quickly, God gave me a word of knowledge. I began to see tools, like tools like a tradesman or craftsman would use, you know, carpentry type tools, all these. And I began to share that with them. I said, look, I'm just seeing tools and like, like a craftsman or, or carpenter would use. Do these mean anything to you? And the man says, the man says, I used to be a, a craftsman before the economic turndown, if you remember the Great Recession. And he goes, and he goes when that happened, you know, the housing and everything, all of that kind of you know, shut down and, and there wasn't the demand. And so I had to leave the carpentry and, and that which I loved and I was very, very good at. And that's when I sort of got into doing you know, the, the barista work in a coffee shop and all of that. And that, that, that filled in the gap and everything. But it's not my heart's desire. My heart's desire is to get back into the carpentry work and working with my hands and doing that type of trade and craft, crafts work. And the Lord just really put on my heart at that point to sort of give him an interpretation then of that word of knowledge. I said, I really feel like the Lord's saying, pick up those tools once again and go after it. God's going to open some door for you. And that man in that brief encounter was so touched, so encouraged by this that that God would just speak to his situation in a moment when he was in a real difficult, challenging place. It just lifted him. You see, hope through the church lifts people, lifts society, and brings an awareness of God's kingdom and that all things are possible with God. Amen? And so, hope that is steadfast must be anchored in truth. We, we, want, we want a solid hope but that hope has to be anchored in truth, and there's only one who is absolute truth, and that is Jesus. Jesus is truth. You see, the people had an expectation for a political Messiah, a governmental Savior, if you will, to lift them above Roman oppression. But you see, that created a wrong expectation. You see, they didn't see that Jesus was coming, would come in two, two waves. It would be a first coming and a second coming. They're expecting a political answer. Jesus is coming to inaugurate His kingdom. And so this wrong expectation caused many in Jerusalem to lose hope that week. You see, they just literally couldn't see, as I just mentioned, prophetically, that He must first come as the suffering Messiah and then He would come as the, uh, if you will, the second coming to fully consummate his kingdom and, and bring God's complete order to, to our world. And so 
Jesus would come, and they couldn't see this, that he would first come as the one who would carry the sin, the sickness, and the brokenness of humanity on the cross. And that is still in the moment that we're in. We're in the church age, or this age of grace, where from the time that Jesus rose, rode into Jerusalem, died on that cross, was resurrected three days later, and, and ushered in then the, the kingdom, and then 50 days later, you know, Pentecost happens, the Holy Spirit is poured out. And so it's the inbreaking of God's kingdom, and the good news of God, God's kingdom kingdom and so we're still in that place of God reconciling the world and drawing people to Jesus as we just read there in John 12 that if he was lifted up signifying what death he would die that on the cross if he was lifted up he would begin to draw all peoples to himself and so we're in that moment and that's the very place that we're in and so Jesus he, he's weeping over Jerusalem that week because he realizes they have a wrong expectation. They don't recognize him. The, I mean, yes, there are people shouting, you know, those shouts of Hosanna, but there's a large group of that population that don't recognize him as the Messiah, and they're befuddled by him, and, and many angered, uh, as we know, and later yelling, crucify him, you know? And so they don't recognize him, but yet he has compassion on them, not an eye of judgment, and God feels the same towards our world right now god's not willing that any should perish but that all would come to repentance and faith in christ have you ever had a wrong expectation as to how god would answer your prayer maybe your cry for deliverance you see sometimes our assumptions as to how god will move in our lives often causes us to miss his answer and his visitation they're crying save us now god jesus is riding in on a cult lowly And they don't realize the answer is right there, but it's not coming in the way that they think. You see, sometimes we don't see the answer and Jesus is riding on a colt. He's coming in a way that's very humble and it's not our understanding of how the prayer should be answered. Our reception of the grace of God is often dependent on our ability to let Him use the foolish to confound the wise, the weak to confound the strong. Now let's go back to John 12 verse 20 for a moment we see that some of the greeks came to worship at the feast of course the pharisees are there too now it's most likely that these are greek proselytes who have come to worship and you get a a little bit of an idea of this in acts chapter 17 verses 1 through 4 where it's talking about some of the greeks but so the greeks were coming to worship even though they were not of jewish descent they were drawn to god through ancient judaism And worship of the king trumps religious tradition. They want the real Jesus. Again, sir, we want to see Jesus. You see, the true worshipers, no matter where they are in the world, they might be in some other religion or following some new age thing or some spiritism or whatever it may be, or just don't even believe in spiritual things, but people want authenticity. They want the real Jesus. They want the Spirit of God. They don't even know it necessarily, but they do. And I love what John would say in John 4, 23-24 earlier in this Gospel. He says, the true worshipers, and this is what he shares after he ministers to a Samaritan woman at the well, the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit, and in truth. And I believe today there is a deep hunger many today for spiritual things in truth. One of the ways I know this is some of the demographics that might look a little negative. They say among millennials that 50% of the millennials that were going to church before the pandemic are now not even going to church or watching online or anything. What that tells me is there's a dissatisfaction with just church. But there's a hunger for spiritual things. That's why we have people getting into all kinds of strange occult type activities and movies and that are occult related and all kinds of different forms of, of mysticism and things. There's a hunger for spiritual things because they haven't found the real Jesus in most of our churches. And God is challenging us right now in this hour. It's like a reset. We've been talking a lot about that you know, this year. It's like a reset that God's giving the church right now to come back to the heart of worship. I don't come back to the heart of prayer where prayer and worship are at the form, again, founded on His Word, absolutely, 
but we want Him. We want to spend time in His presence. You see, number one, they need a gospel of hope. Many of them are hurting. It's an encounter with God's love and to hear Him speak hope and destiny like we did to that man that night. To speak hope and destiny over their lives. But unfortunately, many, what they hear sometimes from our churches and from our lives is that one of judgment rather than affirmation. Remember I shared a message about Jabez there out of the Old Testament a few weeks ago. And his name, that name Jabez, means he will cause pain. And the very thing that Jabez wanted and he prayed for, that God would enlarge his territory, and, and, and he goes, that you would bless me. What he was really asking for is, Lord, I won't cause pain. They want hope. They want affirmation. Jesus died for all, not counting their sins against them. Sometimes I think it's hard for us to see others that way, especially when they're in lifestyles or behavior patterns that seem destructive or, or seem contrary to the ways of God. But God died, Jesus died for all of them, and He's not counting their sins against them. Yes, they need a Savior, and I am not hinting at universalism in any way. All roads lead to heaven and all will be saved. No, I'm not saying that at all. They need a Savior. But they need to know that the Savior has already paid the price for their sin. Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5.19, For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. Again, we're not talking universalism. What we're saying is the way has been made, so no matter how vile someone's past or behavior is, Jesus has already made the way. No one is too far down in the muck and the mire that Jesus can't pull them out and save them. I remember years ago, we were doing some street evangelism down on 4th Avenue. Some of you might remember that. And we were down there and Myself and actually it's another pastor friend of mine back east was with me. He's retired now. And we, him and I were kind of going out. We we're praying for people. And there was a huge crowd of people on 4th Avenue. And all this. And we get down to one, one end of the, of, of the avenue there. And there's this large crowd and somebody's preaching. He's got a megaphone. They're preaching. But it's not a gospel of inclusiveness. It's a gospel of damned and going to hell. <laughs> And I listened to a few minutes of this, and people are getting angry in the crowd. They're getting angry. And, it, and, and the other pastor, he looks at me, he goes, well, it's your city, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I'm like, you're right. And so I just said, young man, I said, excuse me, but Jesus came and he died for everyone. He's not counting their sins against them. And the crowd started, I said, in fact, he loves them. He loves humanity. He loves mankind. And the people started saying, yes, that's right. He loves us. <laughs> the atmosphere shifted. They need a gospel of hope, not a gospel of judgment. Yes, without Christ, we will spend eternity without God. But we need to have a gospel of love and mercy. Number two, it's also a gospel of power. Again, people want the real Jesus. Remember, some make the mistake and it's that they just get so focused on just the Word. It's the Word, it's the Word, it's the Word. Yes, it's the Word and it's the Spirit. The Spirit is what breathed life and put the Word down. And without the power of the Spirit, people also don't have hope. It's the Spirit that breathes. It's the Spirit that touches the hearts of men and women and children that move them to accept Christ. It's the Spirit that releases the miracles and the power that gives witness to the Gospel. It was even Billy Graham. I was reading an account of Billy Graham, which also, by the way, was about in 1950, where he had this tremendous encounter. He was a young evangelist from the South, and and he heard about these meetings in Southern California at this place called Forest Lake Home. And, and uh, this lady, Henrietta Mir, she was a catalyst amongst college-age people. And young, uh, young Bill Bright got his start with Campus Crusade for Christ, was out of one of those meetings. He was new in the Lord and was powerfully touched. It was a godly woman. They said her face shone like the face of Moses when she came out of a prayer meeting. Billy Graham heard about these meetings and he was actually asked to come and speak and he was young in his ministry. And he was supposed to do this big crusade in Los Angeles shortly thereafter. And he was so convicted in the conference, he, he said, I, I, I can't speak. And he just wanted to be a conference attendee and so they said, okay. And he was just so, and one of the, one of the men who was spirit-filled got him aside and said, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people don't know this about Billy Graham. Now, to my knowledge, there's no account of him ever speaking in tongues or anything. However, 
Billy Graham went out and got with God. He went out to, you know, out in the woods that night next to where they were all staying, and he just kept praying and praying. So he was, I guess, on a stump or whatever. And all of a sudden, he had a breakthrough. And the presence of God, the Spirit of God, the peace of God came on him. And everything he said shifted from that point onward. He no longer had, will God show up? Will God move? All of a sudden, he knew God would move. And he knew it was by the power of the Spirit. He did that Los Angeles crusade. And if you remember some of the story of him, that thing exploded. Hundreds came to Christ. And that was the beginning. It's the power of the Spirit. It's also a gospel of power, not in word only. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.20, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Church, we need to make a demand on heaven in this hour. Make no apology for the power of God and for the power of the Spirit. It is what turns the heart of men and women and children. We will not break through a generation that has so much technology and video and all that stuff that has captivated them apart from a church that is praying, a church that is contending, and church believing for the power of heaven to break in and break through hearts that have become hardened to the things of God. Verse 21 of John 12. The Greeks came to Philip, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And that's what they want. That's what we want. The Greeks came for Passover. But something inside of them, am I on? Whoa. Let there be light. Thank you, Jesus. I've been delivered from the handheld microphone. The Greeks came for Passover, but something inside of them cried out to see Jesus. They heard of him, the miracles, his ride into Jerusalem. It's the very cry of humanity all over the world. They are longing to see truth and encounter him. They want the Father's love. I shared a few weeks ago with Mother Teresa, the Catholic sister. She said, there is more hunger in the world for love and appreciation than for bread. Only Jesus, the bread of life, can meet the deepest need of humanity. All through the Gospels, we see the cry of humanity. Luke 17, 12, the ten lepers, they stood afar. Jesus, have mercy on us. Matthew 15, 22, the Canaanite woman, again, a Gentile woman. Not Jesus would even call to the Gentiles yet. And she cries out, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. may not seem relevant in our 21st century American church culture, but I've been, been in places of the world, all over the world, where I've seen the severely demonized. Or I've seen young, young people, young women in fact, just like what happened here with this lady. I remember one time in India, a mother came and she's got her daughter. Her daughter all of a sudden became deaf and dumb. She goes, I don't know what happened. She was a straight-A student in India. It's a really big deal because if they don't pass their exams, they can't go on to higher education. You've got to really do well. They bring this, she brings this young woman. She comes to these meetings and she's like desperate. She is desperate for something to happen. She goes, I don't know what happened. She was studying one night and all of a sudden like this deaf and dumb thing came on her. Uh, it's, it's a lot to unpack, but in Hinduism, there's something like 300 million gods. You can feel tangibly the demo demonic stuff sometimes when you go into places and buildings, and who knows what happened. All I know was this young girl was demonized, and some of the team had been praying for her, and weren't getting where. And all I know is I just came up there, and my heart went out to her, and I just said, no. And my spirit is like, no. I began to pray, and within a few minutes, the girl's talking. She's normal, and the mother just tears are streaming down, to, down her face. Have mercy, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demonized. I watched one, one of my first major encounters with deliverance was one time down in Haiti. It was like the Holy Spirit fell in a meeting of about 5,000 people. So many people were getting touched. Hundreds came to Christ that night, but there was about 20 or so that were so, so severely demonized it began manifesting in the room. They had to send, we had to send young men up into the crowds of 5,000 to get the demonized out and bring them down front. They're down front, and they're just rolling in the dirt, and they're just severely demonized. And one young girl, probably 12, 13 years old, little old, very poor, tattered dress, and she's just so demonized. I will never forget that image as long as I live. We have no idea sometimes the oppression that's out there. You know, long story short, we got them all free that night. <laughs> My, my heart's desire is these that are 
so bound in so many different things in our society. You, you know, it's been said it's a little, little bit of a joke. You know, it's like the demons here are more sophisticated in America. You know, it's like they're there. They're just more, you know, they're there. We want to get people free. Mark 10, 47, blind, blind Bartimaeus, son of, son of Timaeus, sat begging, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Blind Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus. This is someone's son. Personalize this. This is someone who has a real need. Real people with real hurts and pains. And you want to know what's interesting in John 12 here? If you go back, the verses, I didn't read it, the early verses of John 12. It talks about Judas Iscariot, you know, who betrayed Jesus. You know what it says in verse 4 of John 12? But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son. Someone made sure, John did and the Spirit did, that it was recorded that Judas was the son of Simon, whoever Simon was. See, we forget sometimes even the most incorrigible the ones that seem the farthest away from God, that's somebody's son. And the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient. I'm not going to debate where Judas is spending eternity, but I will tell you this, I know the mercy of God is greater than probably what we realize. And I know Judas, when he realized what he had done, he threw those coins down. Right? He was broken. Did he find repentance in that moment? Luke 8.43, the woman with the issue of blood spent all she had with the doctors. Many today, and we love our doctors, our medical community, but there are times the only hope is a miracle from Jesus. She knew she had to get to Him. She said, if I could just touch the hem of His garment, I know, because I've heard the stories. We have, right now in this room, we, we, some need dramatic, major miracles. They healed of cancer and those kind of things. And so we've got to contend and keep contending for more because the miracles, the demand, and what Jesus wants to do. And listen, don't go by what we, you haven't seen. Well, look, we saw this one pass from this, or this one didn't get healed. Look, look, focus on what God has done and is doing. It's a whole other message why some aren't healed, but know that He still is a healer, and we need to keep believing for that. I've seen the look on faces of people all over the world as they come to the meetings. Many, it's their last hope. I shared the story of the Korean revival, remember last week, where someone carried for 30 miles a paralytic boy on their back. Can you imagine putting a young man on your back who's paralytic and you walk 30 miles to get him to a meeting because you heard Jesus was there? And Bob Finley, who, who, wrote this, who told the testimony there in 1950, he was part of inner varsity and what evangelical, you know, didn't even believe in this stuff. He goes, I, I, he goes, I didn't, now I believe. <laughs> he saw that miracle and others healed, right? The Greeks knew that Philip could lead them to Jesus. John 1, 43-46, it says that the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. In other words, we found the Messiah. And Nathanael said to him, just like maybe that person you work with, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, the skeptic that's maybe your neighbor across the street or the person you did share Christ with and they just kind of like, No, I don't need to hear this. Philip said to him, come and see. Don't be discouraged by the skepticism. Philip says, come and see. Philip had an encounter with the Lord that changed him. In a moment, God's presence redirected him. Encounter brought Philip into relationship and destiny. And encounter is still bringing people into relationship and destiny today. I see an army arising, young and old alike in this hour. Unlike we've ever seen. And the people are going to say, I, I don't know, but just if you can get to this one, if you can get to that one, I know that they can, they can point you to Jesus. I, I don't know about you, but I want my life to reflect Him in that kind of way. I'm almost done. There's a cry in our nation. Many are crying out, Save now, O oh God. We've been through a hard time with this pandemic, no doubt, and the economic hardship. Many are crying out, Save us now, God! Save us! 
Some got that stimulus check. I hope they use it wisely. Everybody does. Some will burn through it, spend it on foolish things. But listen, the government isn't the answer. That money doesn't last forever. It's only Jesus. Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Humanity is looking for Jesus in us. Do our lives reflect Him in His glory? 2 Corinthians 5.18, all of these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and who gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 20, Paul says, so we are ambassadors who represent Christ. God is negotiating with you through us. We beg you as Christ's representatives, be reconciled to God. He's given us this ministry of reconciliation. We are His ambassadors. We are destined to be conformed to His image. And again, as we spend time in His presence and Word, we are changed from glory to glory. And as we go into the world, His glory radiates through us to touch everyone. We were in Guatemala many years ago, and Guatemala had a really bad civil war and very torn for many years. And um, we were down there and it was amazing because Guatemala had a major revival that took place there. And you actually, we saw billboards that actually said in Spanish, Jesus is the only solution. Amen. It's true here too, huh? Jesus is the only solution. There's a rumbling in our nation and it's not, it's not the fallout of the election and the politics and the pandemic. No, no, there's, there's, a, there's a rumbling in the spirit. And people are getting to hear and desire about a move of God. And so, <laughs> at, one point, at one point in the midst of our worship today, we were just really taken off. And I looked over one of our leaders here and and I just smiled as I heard the Lord said, just go on and have a revival. <laughs> just go on and have a revival. Uh, Pastor, are you saying, uh, what about God? Is God sovereign? Yes, God is sovereign. But sometimes God's waiting on us to just simply do what He's wanting to do. The Spirit's been given without measure. I talked a lot about that the last three weeks about communion with the Holy Spirit. The river of God's flowing out of us. What are we waiting for? <laughs> Hosanna. The religious leaders in Israel looking for the Messiah to establish His government. But God knew that the greatest need man had was to come to Jesus to have their sins atoned for and be filled with the Spirit and walk in truth with Him. Only Jesus can fill the need of humanity. Not the governments. Not the UN. Again, I thank God. Government needs to help. We need to keep praying. The situation on the border. You know, we've had problems for many, many years now. Different presidents. We need, we need God's solution, right? We need to have a heart for the refugees. We need to have a heart for that. We need good borders. All of this stuff. But bottom line is... Only Jesus can sort through the deepest needs of humanity. Greatest need is to have Jesus completely fill our lives with His presence. And this is going to happen as we sang today, as we die to ourselves and completely surrender to Him. He's the true bread we hunger for. Again, we're not against social programs and meeting the phys physical needs of people, but we must have Him. Church, the hour has come that Jesus should be glorified. Are we willing to pay the price so that He may be glorified in our lives in church? If not us, then who? I was reading, I'll kind of close right here. I was reading last night a little bit. There's this generational theory out there. I'm not sure where I'm at on it, but it's interesting reading. Something like every 80 to 100 years, cycles repeat. Some talk about four four phases to these cycles. The fourth cycle is one of crisis, which some believe we entered into last year, 2020. Some believe that this current cycle of crisis will last somewhere 2026, something like that. Again, I'm just kind of sharing with you these this thoughts. But I hear, here's the thought that being, I love church history and revival history. I'm thinking, okay, all right, I'll buy into that. 
80-year cycle, let's just say that is true. Let's say if there's some teeth to that. And they go back and they look at different 80-year cycles throughout history. And I'm like, okay, so 80 years prior would be about the revival of the mid-20th century that I've talked to you about the last couple of weeks, which happened right after World War II, which was a time of crisis, right? Are you with me? So I'm like, okay. I guess we're due for another major revival then. <laughs> now that's just... So I, 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 I'm going to go by the Spirit of God and what the Spirit's revealing. I'm just saying it's what some secular theorists are talking about, right? But I find it interesting, you secular theorist and what the Spirit... I'm like, hmm, interesting. Would you go ahead and stand? It's about Jesus. Everybody say it's about Him. The prophecies about revival, what the Spirit's revealing, it's all contingent upon our surrendering to His leading. Are we ready to die to our selfish ambitions? Lay aside our own plans and run after Him? It's time, church. Revival is at the door. It's God's gift to us. He wants to touch a nation once again. He's not looking to judge, but looking to redeem. Jesus already paid the price. Father, we just come before you today, and we want you, Lord. We want to be authentic with you. We want to be authentic with one another. We want to be authentic to those in society. God, I just pray you would light the church so on fire we could so lay our lives down for you and as living sacrifices on your altar. And God, a fire from heaven would fall that cannot be extinguished. God, we contend for our kids, whether we have natural kids or not. We contend for the kids, the, the grandkids in our, in our nation, God. We contend for, the, contend for the families that are broken and ravaged by alcohol and drugs and some are in prison or getting out of prison. God, we contend for them, God. We contend for the lost, the lonely, God, the marginalized, God. We contend, God, for those that have no hope, but they're looking for an answer, and the answer is, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Let us be like Philip to be a conduit to point him to You, Lord. And so Holy Spirit, I pray right now, any here or any that are watching that are not born again or backslidden, God, I pray draw them back to You and I pray arms of love. We just give arms of love right now. Welcome back to the Father's house. Those that need these miracles, Lord, we just keep contending and believing, God. We wish to see You, Lord. Now, Lord, I pray all this week, Lord, let just there be a, a building, a building, a building, Lord, an expectancy in this nation, God. Lord, we celebrate Easter Sunday. I pray it be more than about the dinners afterwards and family gatherings. I pray, God, we contend for souls to be saved and a nation's heart to be shifted this week, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. What do you think, church? you think he's riding on a donkey in Tucson? Come on. Come on, yeah. Come on. Listen, if, if you, uh, we'll have some, some of the leaders uh, if, up, available to pray. If you want some more prayer for healing or something, we'll be available here. I don't know. I'm pretty stoked. And whatever the sound system, just a little bump in the road, right? We'll get that. Uh, uh, Jesus is up to something, and it's good. It's really good. Just want to be a part of it. I just want to be a part of it. I, I, don't want to, I just don't want to read about revivals. I want to be smack dab in the middle of one. Yeah.